given the recent shifts in discussion and papers, hopefully there will be more kind of randomized control trials or clinical trials involving language models. Mm. Um, I do think this ambient documentation technology surprised me. It was exceptionally good. And I think mm. it won't be long till we see this in more and more clinics. I, I think this is probably going to be the biggest game changer. I can imagine Mistral developing a model that's now 10 times better than GPT-4. Mm -hmm. They are not open sourcing that. It would be yeah. nearly impossible, that, or meta, like yeah. Facebook making a 10 times model, yeah. model that's 10 times better than GPT-4. They will not open source it. No. They will make a profit of that. Yeah. So the only people then who can make real open source models are academia and all of that. Mm. So I think the real progress will come still from industry. Hello and welcome back to Dev and Doc, a podcast where developers and doctors join forces to discuss topics on AI in healthcare. We've had a bit of a break and now we're back for the new year and we have a lot of interesting things to discuss. I think this episode will be a bit different than usual. I think it would be awesome to cover the nice, the good and the bad things from the last year. Yes. And maybe see a bit the predictions for this year. Our predictions also, as well as basically like what other people are talking about, what do other researchers and even company CEOs and all that think about what will happen in AI this year. I think one of the most exciting things that happened last year was obviously ChatGPT when that yep. came into the public domain. We were promised so much potential. Mm. And obviously as a doctor, as, as, an, as a clinician, I was very excited as to what ChatGPT and other large language models could do for mm -hmm. healthcare. We talked a lot on our podcast about starting off simple, administrating, ad um, automating administrative tasks for doctors mm. and clinicians, but then also the wider things like helping with diagnosis, investigations, and um, helping with the recording and documentation of history taking and things like yeah. that. But a lot of those like still seem prospective. Like what was something that was done? Yeah, so I guess that's where the slightly downfall of the hype comes in. Yeah. So we were promised so much, right? And I think I talked a lot on social media about this and on LinkedIn. Um, the research that's being done now in large language models mm -hmm. um, in a clinical setting is still very much non-existent. So the, in my mind, the research hasn't really moved forward in the last year. Like, you know, we published a paper looking at using ChatGPT to essentially generate differential diagnoses compared mm -hmm. with our own homegrown NHS foresight model that we talked about. Um, and since then, the papers have been still very much in the same setting. So yeah. no one has taken it to a clinical setting for a trial. Everything's still looking at exams or role play actors. Mm -hmm. And even last week, right, um, Google published this. Uh, paper that's been going around. So they've essentially trained another language model called Amy, which is kind of uh, built on top of the MedPalm architecture. Yeah. Um, and that sh showed some promising findings. It showed that, you know, there was a good degree of empathy um, mm -hmm. that they talked about in the paper, and that it was also quite good for generating differential diagnoses. But in my mind, this doesn't really shift the research forward that much. We're still in these controlled, non-clinical environments evaluating large language models. Yeah, I mean, I think that is one standard thing that happens in the computer science domain mm. is that we find benchmarks and then people start competing on those benchmarks, even though the benchmarks are not really representative of the real world cases. Yes. But we then start pushing those benchmarks as much as we can and that becomes the like way to measure those models. And I get it. I mean, it's it's the easy way to do things. Mm. To know is my model better than yours? Yeah. It is much easier to test it on a benchmark than to deploy it in a hospital, use it for a year, and then see does it help patients. Yeah. Obviously, it's much easier to... But I mean, I'm not saying all of this is bad. I mean, this is... Um, this is a start. Yes. But we should just not focus too much on the on just the benchmarks that mm -hmm. maybe are not representative of what we want to do. And I think this was, I agree, this was one of the bad things that 
uh, happened yeah. last year. I mean, but, it's it's. I guess it's not. Yeah, it's just a dis. It's, it's a mild disappointment because I guess yeah. the promise was so high, yeah. and then the reality and delivery just didn't, didn't quite match. excite yeah. me as much. Yeah, yeah. Does, doesn't didn't quite match. Yeah. No, I agree. But there are still like these Amy paper. Yeah. Still had a lot of positive sides, so they showed to some extent that this model they have developed works in some cases better than uh, physicians yeah i wouldn't say like it is better than physicians that would be they've tested it on a small data set mm -hmm. on a very specialized task and all of that so that yes. makes sense but what it shows is that there is potential so things mm -hmm. can be done and now they just need to switch that to the real world and see how can it be tested further so there are some good things there and they employ a new training strategy which is like a self-play strategy yeah i've read about that that's, that's similar to alpha go right yeah no exactly that yeah so they are basically trying to because it is hard to find a lot of data for example for rare diseases mm -hmm. so what you do is you employ the self-play strategy that is trying to simulate the scenarios for conditions maybe for which you don't have data or even just access to health data is mm -hmm. very difficult Mm. So you're trying to do this in a way that you are basically creating your own data or creating your own scenarios that then you can mm. use to train the, the models. That's very interesting. Yeah, because I remember watching the AlphaGo documentary. And yeah. It is, yeah, I think it played itself in oh, yeah. thousands <laughs> and millions of chess games by yeah. itself. Yeah. So it's I mean, very, in a similar approach in the sense. Yeah, that one is, of course, a bit easier because for AlphaGo or something playing Go or chess, yeah. You have a game, you have strict rules, yes. you know did you win or lose, you basically chess, like you know almost at every point mm. what's your standing, was that a good move, was that a bad move, and so on. So it's a bit more difficult yeah. with a patient and with That's a disease, true. but obviously it's possible to some extent. But yeah. let's go maybe a bit back to um, the positive side. So you mentioned a bit the um, ambient note-taking. So, so yes, ambient note-taking. I was pretty skeptical about this and I, I had talked to a couple of founders about this kind of tech as well. Um, essentially, it's basically having a machine listen to your history taking. So, mm. and you know, traditionally in clinics, we speak to patients, we take a history and examination, and then we need to spend, you know, half an hour to one hour basically sitting there dictating and editing our mm. letters, which goes out to the, to the family practitioner. So now with an ambient note-taking device, it basically sits there and records and then writes the note for you so you don't need to dictate. Wait, does it do both like the doctor and the patient? Yes, both that's the idea. Okay, no. So I was really skeptical because in my mind I was thinking, how is this language model going to distinguish between whether it's the doctor or the patient? Mm. And you know, there's a lot of probably superfluous information in histories mm. or important negatives. And how would the model know whether to include that or not? Yeah. Uh, it's not always clear. So I was a bit skeptical. But actually, last week, I tried. Um, we're not sponsored in any way by any of these companies. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I tried one of the ambient note-taking um, uh, companies called Nabla. Um, and we took a kind of neuropsychiatric history. So, okay. So that's different to the normal histories in the sense it's a lot longer. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of... Um, you know, with a real patient? Real patient, okay, yeah. Nice. So, so it, yeah, it works because Nabla is not connected to the... Uh, to the oh, okay. They don't save any of the data and the, the data doesn't go out to their, uh, to them as such. Uh, so we just use it as a trial. But it was very, very nice, actually. The output was... Um, we were all pretty impressed. So How that, long was, like, the recording? So we spoke for... The patients traditionally take about an hour each. Oh, need, okay. You, okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you need to go into the personal history, the yeah. childhood. Yeah, I mean, it takes a long time because these histories... That's what I mean as atypical for a neuropsychiatric history. You not only want to know about the physical symptoms, but you want to mm -hmm. know about their mental health, the psychiatric symptoms. Sometimes you have to delve back to past trauma, um, the childhood, and yeah. things like that. Oh, okay. And the big part of that is also risk assessment. So, mm. you know, a patient comes in with sometimes suicidal ideation or depression. And you need to take a very thorough history to understand what the risks are for this patient, whether they need yeah. any acute um, psychiatric intervention. Um, but yeah, the, the, the output was very good. Um, it basically filtered through a lot of the information which 
I in my head didn't want it to take down mm. um, and it did that automatically and actually produced a really nice output which we still would have to edit um, yeah. and read over but I think it changed the dynamic from you know it probably would have taken an hour to type up that letter and, and get, get it to a secretary to double check and send back yeah um, instead it's produced a pretty good draft that we can edit and could possibly go straight out to the GP or the family practitioner. So it's saved, you know, 75% of the time potentially. Very nice. And is that, is like Nuance the same? Yeah, to my understanding, Nuance is a very similar technology. Okay. And I, I think they were bought out by Microsoft. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, because I think I can connect my positive point of last year to that. Okay, let's Basically go. Basically because let's I go. think these things were made possible by open source LLMs. Oh. So I think like one of the big things for me last year was basically Llama 1 and 2, mm. which was also one of the biggest surprises. I never expected Meta, so Facebook basically yes. to come in with a completely open source large language model yes. and be like, okay, here is it. It's not completely open source. I just want to make that because they have some limit where it's like if you have more than half a billion people using the model, Okay. You have to pay. Okay. Or you cannot use it for that. You, I see. Whatever. It's like so big that no one except for maybe Google comes close to having that many users in any case. Okay. So as long as you're not super successful, yeah. it's free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. You don't care about that. <laughs> and when you are at there, that point, you can build your own model. So it's fine. <laughs> uh, but these models, what they enabled is rapid development in this space. Mm -hmm. Once these models came out, like a couple of months later, we basically saw smaller models that are performing on the level of nearly ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. We saw like a lot of people working on optimizing and speeding mm. up. So basically you can run it on your own laptop and it can be decently, it can run like decently well so that you are mm. not losing like a lag of five minutes before you get one word on yeah. the output. So I think all of these came with those open source large language models. And that was one of the big things that happened yes. last year for me. Did you, did you play with any of these or did you try any um, of the open source so ones? I tried Llama um, 7B, mm. um, basically just, just for a separate project that I was doing looking at whether large language models can understand the smoking status of oh, patients. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so I had a play around with that, and yeah, um, I mean, results are still pending, but mm. but preliminary results show that it's pretty good, like nice. bet, pro probably on par or better than the named entity recognition stuff we've been doing. Nice. Um, I yeah. did see that, like, in a lot of cases, it takes a bit of time to really train these models and mm. to learn how to use them it's not really like out of the box yes of course it will be it will get a bit better we are still like early stages there but for a lot of these models it takes a bit of time to get them right i was recently building so if if one of the in one of the previous podcasts we were talking about foresight mm -hmm. i was recently making foresight version 2 which is like the next yeah, predict model the next that. diagnosis or events in the patient's history. Which is really yeah, so exciting. it's just a language model used to predict the patient's future, basically. Yeah, just uh, that. Yeah, yeah. That's it. <laughs> it's a bit tricky, <laughs> but, but in any case, I was now building it on top of Llama two and trying like how can it, how can I combine it with other yes. language models and all of that. Man, it it takes a bit time. It yeah. takes a bit time to make it properly and to really get the parameters and to train it right and mm. when you are changing the model a bit it's it's a bit tricky so all of these models are still like early stages but for a lot of companies they enabled the creation of a lot of companies and they enabled mm. creation of tools like the one from nabla i'm not sure like is nabla really are they using yeah. nama but or whether they're plugged into the chat GPT open API. Yeah, uh, it cannot uh, be because API it's or... running locally. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, so it has to be it has to be a local model, and probably they benefited from mm. the open source models. So I think that was that was really nice. Yeah, yeah. I guess I wanted to build on that point where you're saying yes, these open source community and models really help to drive innovation and companies. Mm. But funnily enough. 
you know, recently the chat GPT, the open AI store has opened. Yeah. Which is the flip side of that closed, you know, closed source model, but mm. to drive business and companies. I don't know what your thoughts were with that. I mean, I'm not too big of a fan of it. I think that is how it works. So the GPT store is basically like OpenAI came with the idea like you can give them a bit of your data, mm -hmm. train a model, all is hidden. So you just send your data, they train a model, basically they have all the algorithms for that, they train a model and then they just make it public. So then you can access mm -hmm. it either via an API yeah. or really the chat interface, yeah. the chat GPT interface. Yeah. And this is very interesting, right? In terms of the general meta of OpenAI, yeah. um, you know, they they were supposed to be this open source company that was yeah. driving towards artificial general intelligence, but now it's almost like it's a closed sourced for maximum profit company. Yeah, uh, I mean <laughs> that is now obvious. Um, they are now going for yeah. they are just going for how to make money, and all yeah. of these products are basically they will drive engagement. Exactly. There was one interesting thing I saw a couple of days ago. It's like, can you guess what is the most popular uh, model in the GPT store? Like, what is the domain that most people are currently using? Was the, what was the most popular model? Oh, so something that was built out of the ChatGPT base model or GPT-4B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember I saw some lists, but isn't like a PDF GPT quite popular? Yeah. So that reads PDF documents and summarizes them. Yeah, there are two. I think um, one of them was like, there was one that was like artificial girlfriends. Oh, that's, which was, that was like, the mm. I was going to go for, <laughs> yes. <laughs> which was interesting, but currently the two most popular ones are exactly as you said. So the one that is, you upload a PDF and then you can yeah. ask questions. And the other one was basically for uh, writing scientific papers. Oh. And to be honest, I think this is not a positive indicator because mm. I think when you have something like this, it basically shows that the GPT store is not that popular. So you have basically scientists using it and yeah. I don't know who oh, is, uploading, is, everyone, who is right. uploading PDFs to ask questions. Wait, I started doing that. <laughs> you said, okay, <laughs> interesting. Well, I was really thinking who is doing that. So like, uh, you know, I don't work for, I don't work for OpenAI, but it's actually quite nice. So what I did was I uploaded a uh, research paper onto the ChatGPT app on my phone. Yeah. Uh, and then you can basically get it to read the PDF. Um, and then as I'm commuting, I can ask it questions based oh, on the research okay. paper or clarify things I don't uh, understand nice. the research paper. Although I have to say it, it didn't really work that well. And a bit, just because it was so verbose, right? Yeah. So, so to to answer my question, it, it would take it a minute over, and a half. Yeah, it overdoes it. After like yeah. re clarify re and yeah, um, and then I think everyone in the office thought I was insane or something because <laughs> I, I was just sat there asking, <laughs> asking, just yeah. talking to the AI. Like, oh, what about this condition? What about this symptom? And everyone yeah. was like, are, "Are you talking to me?" I'm like, "No, I'm talking to my AI um, model on my phone." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but in any case, I still think like it is. It's interesting. It is still early stages, obviously, because as I said, like scientists are using it and yeah. people who want to ask PDF questions. Yeah. But funnily enough, you mentioned the AI girlfriend thing, which is, yeah. I guess, becoming more popular. But there is also, I think, character, character.ai. Yeah, character, yeah, yeah. So that's also a very popular um, LLM, which you can select a character like Harry Potter or someone famous and yeah. basically talk yeah. to them. So, I mean, and they're like, I don't know, millions and millions of users yeah um, yeah they even have like millions of different characters yeah. and millions of users so this this also shows you that there is some kind of gap in that the market people are lonely and yeah <laughs> unfortunately yeah. people in this day and age are becoming more and more isolated and yeah. you know uh, that might be a conversation for another day to come back around to our main topic um mm -hmm. i maybe want to mention just a couple of things also from last year that were a bit disappointing, at least to me. Like mm. one of the biggest ones was uh, Gemini. Mm -hmm. So the model from Google that came out was that like November or last year? Yeah, yeah something yeah, like that, yeah. like end of last year. And what was disappointing is that I was expecting more from Google. Mm. They basically were talking about this model for months. 
Yeah. It was supposed to be the best thing ever. It's like multimodal. It's combining all of the mm. things ever. It can do everything. Um, they will spend hundreds of millions to train it. I think in the end they buy some speculations, spend close to a billion to train really? the model. And so that's what Google Bard is uh, based on, right? Currently, yeah. yeah. For yeah. a lot, of, I think maybe not everywhere, but for most countries, they were releasing these by country. So I think in UK currently, you, yeah. you are using Gemini so, so, as the base. So as GPT-3 is to Gemini, is also as, as ChatGPT is to Google Bard. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, Bard should be like the general assistant yeah. and Gemini should be the underlying mm -hmm. technology. Yeah. Yeah. And it did not really outperform GPT-4. Yes. So it, to some extent, on one of the tasks, it performed better. But mm -hmm. they really like... Yeah, they milked it, I remember. In, yeah, in exactly. PR they statement. went through like seven different modifications of the model. And if you do this and if you do that, but yeah, if you yeah, prompt oh, it in this Yeah, way, if you're doing like chain of thought prompting yeah. with Gemini versus... Just zero shot prompting on GPT-4 or something. Yeah, it's yeah, like it's, it got a bit messy. Yeah, yeah. And for many tasks, it was basically on the level of GPT-4. And what is important to understand here is that GPT-4 is a year old technology. Mm. So like GPT-4 came out or basically was fin has, has finished training a year before mm. Gemini came out. So basically a year later, Google did not really make any improvements yeah. how how did they keep on you know how did they keep on top of the leaderboard because there are these um yeah. you know lm leaderboards and chat and gpt4 remains like top one yeah. or two always I yeah how they do that it is that is a really big question i think yeah. everyone is asking that because no one really outperformed gpt4 properly yeah. there were like small improvements Mm. But no one really outperformed it in the last year. And that was also, again, a bit of a dis disappointment. I will yeah. go like, I think once we go into the predictions for this year, we can yeah. go a bit more into what will happen and where will GPT-4 go. Yeah. But, but just to yeah. go back to Google here on DeepMind, I don't know. I was really expecting more from DeepMind. Yeah. I was thinking, it is still like, don't get me wrong, the model's nice. It is doing the multimodality aspect much nicer than many other models. Uh, it also can do audio mm. like very nicely and it's all combined into one model. So it's not that I need a spec. So if you are looking at GPT-4, how it does audio currently is that you basically record an audio segment. Yeah. It converts that from audio Towards, to text yeah. and then feeds the text into GPT-4. Yes. While Gemini, at least one of the versions of Gemini can do raw audio directly. Very nice, yeah. And like, there are benefits to that. It can get emotions out of the text. It can get mm. out of the speech, sorry. That's interesting. It can get much more information than a simple uh, speech to text model. So, yeah. And then GPT-4 just gets the text, so. Yes, yeah. And, and the same is video. Good. So yeah. it can also get video input and has like many other okay. interesting features. But so, it's not a big yeah. step. But that's nice because we did talk about large multimodal models in, in, in one of our last episodes. And yeah. I think being having that foundational model is a lot better than, like you said, oh, for sure. or as a surrogate where you just yeah. do speech to text and then, yeah. then prop the model. Especially also important in healthcare. Yes. I think if you are assuming you are building like a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say building a psychiatrist, but like just may maybe building like an aid that yeah. will help you a bit, that will talk with you, that will yeah. do a bit of consulting or something and, like and, that. And there are companies doing this. Yeah. There are AI mental health chatbots. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. If you have these, it is extremely important to understand the tone of voice for Completely. someone. Yeah. So it helps a lot and it is, it's an advancement. But I was just thinking with respect to reasoning, with respect to like the general, let's say, intelligence of the models, it did not really show a big improvement compared to all the benchmarks mm. that exist, and not even just benchmarks. Compared to, I'm, I was basically using Gemini Pro over that last two, three weeks, mm -hmm. almost constantly. I would still 
I'd still much rather go to GPT-4 and even mm. ChatGPT than to Gemini Pro. It, it was much more prone to hallucinations and much more prone to just random stuff. I would basically ask it like a simple question. Like, I'm writing a paper and I need a couple of citations for okay. large language models that came out in the past three months. Yeah. And I asked, oh, give me three archive links. Archive is the publishing website. Yeah. Give me three archive links of I'm three LLM thinking. papers. Random links. Really? Has no connections. See, that was the stuff that was happening in the first few months of ChatGPT. Yeah. But, uh, but do you think because ChatGPT was first to market, they have more data and they can reverse engineer and like stop those hallucinations. Whereas because BARD is still quite new and the users, I assume, are a lot less. They have but, less data to like retrain the model and iterate through. I mean, maybe, but again, BARD is also not that young anymore. Yeah, but no one's like, using it. Like, is that... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So where, where's the feedback loop from the data? No, there are users, for sure people right? using yeah. it. Maybe for yeah. sure it's not on the, the level Google of GPT-4, yeah. but people are still using it. So yeah. in any case, that yeah. was a bit of the... I think bad side of the last year for yeah. the general LLMs. Didn't live up to the hype. Yeah, didn't no. live up to the hype. We were at the, we were speaking, I think, in the last episode or the episode before that about risks of AGI mm. and all of that. Mm. And in February last year, like everyone was talking about AGI. When yes. GPT-4 came out, everyone was like, oh, AGI in two months, we are going to die. Yes. And it turned out that we didn't really move from that stage much. We didn't move at all, in fact. No, these Currently, milestones there are... are always changing, the AGI yeah. milestones. And have you seen that recent paper where they, I think they surveyed a few thousand AI experts and they basically asked them uh, when they think, you oh, know, yes. when they think AGI will come. Yeah. And, you know, very... One of the things I hate yeah. the most. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I hate the most, I even like a lot of blog posts do this. Uh, we can put the one on screen, but I'm, I don't have anything against these blog yeah, posts. Like, yeah. I even like the blog posts. I read it often. But a lot of people do, like, give me the probability or they predict yes. the probability that we will have AGI in the next five years. Yes. And then they have probability is 15%. How did you... <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Well, it's even for the questions they're asking that I saw was, what's the probability of of an AGI that can automate 10% of current human tasks. <laughs> yeah. And then I think they said over oh, the next three to five years, maybe around five to 10% of human labor could be automated by Random AI. guessing. Um, I hate that. Like, go do stuff, don't do <laughs> random predictions. A lot of people do this. And I think this is just go do it or go show it. Yeah. And this is like, Oh, whatever. No, it's no, interesting, no, yeah. it's interesting to see what they think, though, like people working in the field and where they think the direction is headed. I think yeah. it's nice in some it's ways. It's fun. No, okay, let's do, let's say it like this. It's fun, yeah. but should not really be acted upon. Because I think, no, like... There is no action. What was the action? No, but you can take action. Because I think one of the things are, like, if I know AGI will be achieved or someone is saying with 90% probability yeah. we'll have AGI in the next 10 years, you can change how you work. You can change how you do. You can yeah. change everything. You can change your whole life because you know AGI will come in five years. Yeah, change jobs. Yeah, so you shouldn't really act too much upon it. Universal <laughs> basic income as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you can have many changes. You should be pushing that, that more, maybe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For doctors specifically. So I think this, this aligns now perfectly with predictions for next year. Yes. Or not next year, sorry, predictions well, this for this year. year, now, year. Yeah, January, no. yes. yeah. So I wanted to basically have a look at um, one prediction from the co-founder of Hugging Face. Yeah. Should we bring this up? Yeah, we can bring this up on screen. So yeah. So biggest predictions for 2024. Yeah. Let's go. So this guy, um, so co-founder Hugging Face, he's basically mm. saying that a, a couple of things. I think some things are awesome, some things maybe not so much. Mm. But he's basically saying that open source models will catch up to closed source. So we will achieve with Llama or whatever other Mistral or whatever mm. other model will get very close or on pair with GPT-4, Gemini and all the other models. What do you think? Um, I mean, so far, it's always been a game of catch-up, right? Um, yeah. But you do find these closed proprietary models come out, mm. and then months later, 
the open source community rallies and you know catches up to quite quite a close benchmark actually yeah, i think yeah. mistral is very high up there at the moment yeah um so but i i can't see them overtaking mm -hmm. at this moment in time right uh, yeah and you know where's the yeah i don't know the research and direction is still very much been pioneered by these closed source companies yeah. but but i guess they're not doing anything new you know at the yeah. moment the new implementations are these mixture of expert things and uh, machines and that that architecture was the paper came out last year I remember early last year so yeah theoretically maybe the open source community can catch up but what what do you think I think it's a bit wishful thinking I mm. think it's if if we do catch up it means we did not progress mm. I think the progress that open source is doing is a lot in making the model smaller, optimizing yes, them, speeding them up, yeah. personalizing them, fine-tuning them for specific use cases and all of that. But open source doesn't really have the resources to do something on big scale, to mm. do a million experiments on a million GPUs and then make a better model, make a new better model. Mm. And I think if we do catch up, it means there was no progress. But GPT 4.5 yeah. or GPT 5 did not came out and mm. we didn't make any progress. But that's interesting. So do you, why do you think, I guess is the question, why do you think closed source companies and models pioneer? Is it purely because of the funding and money? I think or is it the expertise? I, I mean, currently, I think it's obviously money and just having the resources. But do you think it's because of who they employ? People like Ilya Sutskova yeah. or Andre Kapafi, they're kind of leaders in their field. Do you think money buys better engineers who, and who have a bigger team to then drive these models forward? For sure. I mean, it makes sense because if now there is some genius somewhere and he made whatever new advancement in AI and something, he would want to go to open ai yeah. they have the best models they have the current best people and they have resources to do whatever he wants so if you mm. have someone somewhere came up with something that's mm. good which open ai is doing like whoever publishes an awesome paper yeah. and something open ai goes and hires them it doesn't have to be open ai it can be microsoft can be google can yeah. be whoever but they have the money to hire them Okay, but what's the alternative if someone doesn't want to go to these private companies and help them? Yeah, I think like the alternative to that is go to a university or an institute or a lab or something like that mm. where you will be paid 10 times less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, the people that are, you will not have the GPU resources needed if I ignore the pay. So a lot of people and me included doesn't care too much about the payment. Yeah. Give me enough that I can live with and that's it. I don't care about mm. more. But you don't have the thousands of GPUs. Most universities have five, ten, a hundred GPUs or something, and you have hundreds of people competing for those GPUs. Yeah. So what, what do you do? Oh, man. Yeah, you have to ask for permission to yeah. use GPUs. You need to fight for time allocated slots. It's yeah. not and great. And you are then basically, so what you are left with is you can make small models and optimize them because that is what you have resources for and that's mm. what you can work on so that's why i think open source is basically doing that i think academia is driving open source yes. has to be at least to some extent because you have yeah. millions of researchers basically yeah. working on these and publishing the results but they don't have the resource and also like researchers are motivated by publications and all of that yeah. and i don't have the freedom to spend which is such an irony like i don't have the freedoms to spend three years working on one project and not publishing if i do that yeah is this publish or <laughs> yeah, die right um, exactly uh, yeah it's terrible so, and if you look at open ai the first like three four years they didn't do anything they didn't make any like real progress yeah they published at that point like it was one paper every two three years yeah they had the freedom to spend a lot of money, which OpenAI was and is a bit unique in that aspect. Yeah. But DeepMind was similar, for example, and yeah. currently Meta. Yeah, you, you Facebook, find that these kind of independent research organizations or foundations 
slowly tend towards capitalism and then, yeah. and then essentially turn into these money making giants <laughs> yeah. and, and discard all the previous ethics. <laughs> and I think it is. Imagine, like, currently Meta and Mistral and a couple of companies are making models open source. Like, imagine Mistral developing a model that's now 10 times better than GPT 4. They mm -hmm. are not open sourcing that. It would be yeah. nearly impossible, that, or meta, like yeah. Facebook making a 10 times model, yeah. model that's 10 times better than GPT-4. They will not open source it. No. They will make a profit of that. Yeah. So the only people then who can make real open source models are academia and all of that. Mm. So I think the real progress will come still from industry. And I think there are two options for this year. Either no real progress, like incremental small stuff with GPT-5 maybe, mm. and like smaller things. And then we will have a race of basically catch up between open source and closed source. I think all will be on a very similar level. But if GPT-5 comes out and it's over the top, <laughs> then then I don't know what will happen. You, okay, so that I guess that's another prediction. Do you think GPT-5 will come in and break all of those I think uh, so. benchmarks. I hope so. Complete states of the art. I hope so. I think it will break all the benchmarks. Mm, By how much it would be. I, there was a talk with a podcast I just listened to yesterday, I think, between Bill Gates and Sam Altman. Yes. And they are talking a bit there about GPT-5 mm. or 4.5. 4 it's hard to know what people are talking about today because 4.5 also didn't come out. Yeah. And people are talking about GPT-5 also. I don't know. It's a bit messy. Well, that is the other thing. Like, GPT-4, we only see it as a static model. But is it... Yeah. It, I mean, it's definitely slowly being changed and iterated in the in the back background. Yeah. It's not really um, getting better. So it can no, be... Maybe there are some... safer, maybe. It's getting... Yeah, it's getting well, safer some, and maybe even a bit ways. worse. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it definitely is getting a yeah. bit worse for, for maths and things like that. But. So it's basically in the podcast, they were talking about, like, the main thing they want to focus on. And I think, like, reasoning and personalization planning. and video capabilities yeah. planning. So all of those things will be GPT-5. Okay. And that's exactly what we talked about in our, yeah. in our previous episode, um, which, which we'll put in the link. Yeah, below. how to achieve AGI. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. steps to AGI and, and the deficiencies of current large language model yeah. approaches. Um, find any other predictions to wrap up? Any big predictions? Um, I think so. This guy, uh, sorry, his name is uh, he, Clement, I think, he's French. And a couple of other his predictions for like, oh, some companies from some big AI companies will fail, which is expected, of course. Of course. Uh, I don't know who will that be or whatever, but for sure it will be companies that did not really succeed in what they set out to do. Yeah. And currently, the only real progress still, again, is coming only from OpenAI. Yeah. No other company really made something that moved the bar forward. Yeah. So all, obviously, some of the, these companies will fail because they did not really improve on the AGI. Yeah, and it's it's a first to market competition. Like whoever yeah. first gets the most customers, and then you can refine your model from there. Yeah. So it's very. Yeah, unless you have a lot, lots of money like Google to pump in and to yeah. to compete is really hard for any new founder to do that. Okay, and any other big predictions? So I think most others are basically like other breakthroughs in applying AI to other areas. I think until now we basically we're still mostly focusing on LLMs for the building of LLMs. Yeah. yeah. So how, what do you think? Like, how will these be? What do you think are like the concrete things we are going to achieve this year in applying AI to healthcare? Um, that's really, I think AI in healthcare has come a long way and large language models is a big part of that. Mm. I do believe given the recent shift in discussion and papers, hopefully there will be more kind of randomized control trials or clinical trials involving language models. Mm. Um, I do think this ambient documentation technology surprised me. It was exceptionally good. And I think mm. it won't be long till we see this in more and more clinics. I, I think this is probably going to be the biggest game changer for and this year. That I how can see. about like 
I still want to see AI doctors, no matter what, like I'm still somehow thinking, yeah. I want to see, I don't know, especially for mental health. Do you mm. think we'll start seeing like initial stage it doesn't have to be like a mental health consult or a mental health friend, like yeah. an AI mental health friend. I mean, AI doctors will come, I'm sure, but um, I think for now there will be probably more assistants slash chatbots where you mm. you have to be very careful how you market it, right, and get the regulations and approvals. I don't think you can have a standalone bot there, basically managing the mental health entirely. It needs to yeah, be. Yeah. It needs to be a clinician. For now, maybe it, it would be something akin to like a friend or something you chat to or mm. AI journaling. I think that's a big thing. Yeah. Uh, just to detect how your mood fluctuates, what are your triggers and things like that. Um, but one other thing I wanted to cover, which we haven't really covered as much, outside the realm of language models, there's so much happening in AI drug discovery. Mm -hmm. Like absolutely huge. Uh, you know, we see all these labs cropping up like isomorphic labs. Spin off from Google, uh, focus solely on this task of using AI to identify new drug targets, new candidates, and it's been really successful so far. We saw that uh, a company called Benevolence AI during the COVID pandemic identified some possibly pretty useful antiviral targets mm -hmm. that we did end up using similar drugs for in COVID. And likewise, recently, I think there was a paper that came out that found some potential new candidates for antibiotics even, which are really useful. Yeah. Oh yeah, the paper from MIT that yes. where basically they used like deep learning or graph networks yes. to come up with a completely new class of antibiotics. Yes, and that's incredible, right? And we definitely need an episode talking about graph mm -hmm. models because I want to delve deeper into that as well. Yeah. But just, you know, a quick preface is antibiotic resistance is a huge problem in hospitals. Patients are coming in that are resistant to your traditional penicillin, cephalosporins, yeah. and then you're scratching your head thinking about what can we prescribe this patient to treat this, you know, very severe infection and sometimes there aren't any candidates left. So having a new antibiotic drug discovery would be incredible, game-changing. Mm. Okay, so basically to wrap up this section a bit, we think that we will have quite a bit of movement in drug discovery, yes. in ambient note taking. So a lot of these, like maybe a bit more administrative tasks in healthcare. Absolutely. But maybe not that much yet. Something that is like directly affecting the patient or directly working with the doctor. Yeah. And nothing to replace clin clinicians, yeah. right? It's still very much a tool that aids doctors to either see patients or enhance yeah. what they're doing currently. Yeah, 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 and I do hope that very soon we will also get the proper uh, AI vision in healthcare so that we have, we, we can basically, it is already there, but it should just be a bit more widespread so that we make the job of radiologists a bit easier. Mm. I think this is something we've been speaking for the past like 10 years. Yes. I still remember the... Um, Jeffrey Hinton. Yeah, the Jeffrey yeah. Hinton note where he said basically like, oh, AI will replace radiologist in a year. Yeah. Ten years later, it still didn't, but... Absolutely. I, yeah, it so. will not replace, and it's not the purpose to replace. The purpose is just to... Assist, assist and enhance. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, completely. So, yeah, we expect that. With respect to the general LLMs and AI field, I think that GPT-5 will come out, will move the bar. Mm. We will, and probably it will be the only thing that will move the bar. Probably others will try. Let's see, eh? <laughs> yeah. No, of course, I would love for someone else to also do it. Yeah. Well, open source will still be catching up a bit, making these small personalized models, applying them to, I don't know, specialized use cases and all of that, mm -hmm. which of course makes perfect sense for small models. And they are still extremely useful and extremely needed. Mm -hmm. That's how we make all of this progress. Yes. Yes, and I expect ambient note-taking to really take off. You start seeing it in more and more clinics. Um, I think it really does save a lot of time and had some yeah. exceptional outputs. And I'm very interested to see, you know, this will create a new data set as well, like the actual conversations and ambient note-taking data set, rather than traditionally what we've been doing, taking clinical notes that are written by clinicians. Yeah. So I'm really excited what that can yield. Or... GPT-5 will come out to be AGI and or will be done in a couple of 
mind space. Yeah, uh, yeah, and the world. That's will an land, option. Yeah. Probably, <laughs> the world will land. Yeah, Sam so Altman will be our, our like emperor, overlord, god, yeah. Yeah, overlord. <laughs> <laughs> So let's hope it's not that option. Let's hope it's <laughs> all the other ones we want. Yes, the options are automating administrative clinical workflow yeah. or uh, Sam Altman the overlord. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the first one hopefully. That will be all for this time. Uh, we will be a bit more regular with our publishing from now on. We'll be doing that every second Thursday at 8 a.m. GMT time. In between of these, we will add a bit of tutorials like how to train your LLM, how to make something for healthcare, how to apply one of these research papers. So basically a bit tutorials, bit of coding, bit of, I don't know, just learning yeah. a bit more. Yeah, I think this year we do want to drive the channel forward. We have a studio space as well, hopefully coming yeah. up soon. And if there's anything you'd like us to cover in the future, do drop us a comment and, and let us know. Awesome. Thank you very much for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. See you. Bye.